You are now tuned into the Black Law Students Association of Canada's YouTube. Thank you, Council. Mr. Lee? Hello, Justices. My submissions before you today are those of arguments of the appellant, Mr. Jamal Andrew Williams, which are based in theory. Justices, as you've heard from my co-counsel, Ms. Klein, this case concerns the respondent's failure to collect disaggregated race-based data during the COVID-19 pandemic. But this appeal is about much more than data. It is fundamentally about race. The respondent's failure to take any action whatsoever to help Black Canadians through this unprecedented pandemic is symptomatic and symbolic of the way that racial inequity is propagated in the modern age. Thankfully, through this court, the Diversity High Court of Canada, we can take steps towards a better future of racial justice in this country. My co-counsel has already presented the appellant's position that his rights were violated under existing jurisprudence, and we stand by that position. But this morning, we invite you to go further, to fulfill this court's noble purpose and infuse our law with a better understanding of how to deal with race. Today, the appellant asks no less of you than to fundamentally rewrite aspects of our jurisprudence so that we might purge antiquated logic from our law books and move a little closer to the equality promised in our charter. Today, we have an opportunity to reimagine problematic doctrines that have propagated harmful structures and take steps towards a world where the playing field is just a little bit more fair. Mr. Lee, why, why should this court step in and exercise any of its powers when this appears very much to be an issue for the legislature? Well, I will address that in my submissions on deference, Justice Ong if that would, uh, but as a brief uh, preview to that, I would say that this, this court's fundamental role and the role of all courts in this society is to be a guardian of, of rights, constitutional rights and minority rights. And the legislature certainly has an important role to play, but in this case, we're discussing an infringement of minority rights and that is well within the purview of this court. My submissions today will suggest three changes to Canadian law, three equality measures. First, that the doctrine of deference to parliament should be abandoned in cases that deal with constitutional rights of racialized people. Second, that section 15 sub two of the charter should be read as imposing a duty on the government to take affirmative action toward racial equality when making broad policy decisions. And finally, that the Oaks test as it pertains to sections seven and 15 be modified to include the insights of critical race theory as an overriding guiding principle. Mr. Lee, I'm just gonna ask my question again. I, I appreciate you have a, a script, but uh, I, want that answer, I want that answer to that question now. So why should this court not leave this question for the legislature? The legislature is fundamentally an institution of the majority. And this court, the purpose of this court is to defend minority rights. The questions we are asking this court to do as the diversity high court, a court to which, which is above all prior, prior jurisprudence and even above the constitution, <clears throat> is to inject into our legal system an understanding of race and racial equality. That is the fundamental purpose of this court. The legislature fulfills a different purpose. The legislature proposes and makes legislation, <clears throat> but the courts are the guardians. And I would briefly touch on the case law in Vreen that the courts recognize that waiting for specific discriminatory legislation poses a challenge in that it becomes reactive and causes a burden on uh, those who are affected. If this was such a concern, then when the H1N1 virus was released, there was no uh, there was no concern necessarily to make the statute then. So why is this being raised now before this court? 
I can't speak to what decisions were made or not made at the time of the H1N1 virus, but we submit that at this time, and with the modern understanding of race and critical race theory, and in the modern context, that this is the appropriate time for this court to intervene. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lee. Proceed. Thank you. The issues with deference are twofold. First, it places Mr. Williams' fundamental charter rights at equal weight with the misguided prejudice of those who would twist data to serve a racist agenda. The court, the majority in this case, in Mr. Williams' case before the Supreme Court, engaged the doctrine of deference by balancing Mr. Ch Williams' charter rights against the possibility uh, that the data would be twisted and misused uh, by those who wish to articulate anti-Black prejudice. In so stating, <clears throat> the majority allows the government to restrict Mr. Charter's rights because of Black Canadians, dis because the fact of Black Canadians' disproportionate harm from the pandemic will be misinterpreted. The appellant asks this court to reject the idea that this is an equal balance. Both racial and legal justice demand that the scale tips in favor of Mr. Williams' rights. That's all. If we already know that Black Canadians are disproportionately affected by the pandemic, that seems to be the basis of the reason why we're asking for more data collection. What's the point of adding this further layer of, of data collection? Why should we as a court step in and mandate that the government collect data on something we already know is a problem and already exists? Certainly. Part of the reason we would submit that is because the alternative is to allow the government to do nothing on racial injustice, to do nothing to help its most vulnerable people and to learn firsthand of what they are going through during this pandemic. Race, racial data from other jurisdictions are suggesting that this is a relevant and important piece of information for a policymaker to know who is vulnerable to the pandemic. So to your question, I would say, um, <clears throat> the information is crucial in this particular case. And, and I, you're likely gonna to touch on this a little bit in your submissions, um, you know, judging from what you've already said, but once that data is collected or that information is collected, what prevents it from being misused for some of the purposes you've already mentioned in terms of perhaps deepening stereotypes and, and public perceptions of racialized communities? Certainly. Well, we would submit, first of all, that if a person is willing at this point to look at data which draws no correlation and finds no fault between uh, a disparate outcome and a people, that they were very likely to find such a connection, regardless of whether this information was published. This is the basis of deeply held prejudices. In other cases, we would submit that there are ways to make the data more transparent, such as by involving community groups, uh, minority community groups directly in the data collection process so that it doesn't have to be an entirely paternalistic top-down data collection regime. There are ways to ameliorate these risks, but the fundamentally <clears throat> the, the risk is propagating a system which, was, which would propagate anyways, regardless of whether the data is collected. We submit that the benefits of this data and the healthcare and, able to, and ability to make a strong health policy also far outweigh those risks. Mr. Lee, just going off on that, your, your friend, Ms. Klein, ended her submissions with I believe the words were uh, seeking self-reported, self-reported race-based data. And, and don't you think that that's a major problem? And that even if this court grants the the relief that you're requesting. We're still subject to the individual whims and personal decisions of every single Canadian. So, so this, this entire exercise could be for naught in the sense that if we grant this relief that you're seeking, well, then every individual is just perhaps, we're, you know, we're gonna get a skewed sense of, of what, who, who the actual parties are, are suffering from COVID or any other uh, medical uh, disease because it's self-reported. So my question to you is this, you, you've thought about this question of self-reported. Uh, is that where it ends? You, you just leave it as self-reported? 
understand your question correctly, Justice, you're asking about the inaccuracies of relying on self-reported as opposed to objective data? Well, it's, it's, I mean, look, it's going to be objective anyway, because the data is the data. But what I'm suggesting is I'm, 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 I'm shocked that you didn't, you wouldn't go so far as to suggest that it's mandatory. Well, it's a, uh, to that concern, uh, Justice Song, there are some concerns uh, with, within the field of critical race theory about making such data mandatory, compulsory. There are concerns in that field that compelling a person to identify their race can have effects such as discouraging them from seeking health care, which is not something that we want. We want to ensure that we're collecting the best data that we can and in a way that builds trust within the community, but without uh, risking uh, scaring people away from better care. But that, but that, you know, this is a very interesting point, Mr. Lee. So, so you take the black population, for example, you've got, you know, half of them perhaps that, uh, you know, might agree with this and you have another half that doesn't necessarily believe that, they, that perhaps they feel that uh, there's further, further disenchantment uh, because of that, revealing of that race, uh, race piece. So um, I guess what I'm suggesting to you is how is this court to balance those two competing issues? It's a fair question. I would answer, I'll give a quote from uh, Alan Fremont and Nicole Lurie. These are scholars who work in the field of medical racism. They write, Tracking the racial and ethnic composition and changing healthcare needs of different populations is vital if our healthcare system is to fulfill its essential functions. If data collection is vital, if it is that critically important for our healthcare system, and if our, as my co counsel has said, <clears throat> if those in power are to make informed decisions, we need this data. And we suggest that there are ways to collect the data beyond doing absolutely nothing which is what the respondent has done. You don't disagree with me that if we grant your appeal that this is a shot in the dark, that we don't know which way, we don't know which way the data is gonna be used, just as uh, my sister, Judge Justice Hanif mentioned. We don't, we don't know if this is necessarily going to change uh, the, uh, the improvement of, of, of healthcare for um, visible minorities and black Canadians. You agree with me, correct? Yes. And you're asking this court what to side on the on the side of critical race theory? Is that is that what you're asking? Well, critical race theory is not a monolith, but yes, essentially yes. Okay, thank you. I understand thank the you. direction. <clears throat> our second proposed measure, found at page 13 of our factum, relates to section 15 sub 2 of the charter. In short, the appellant submits that this section has been interpreted too narrowly and that this interpretation has resulted in an artificially low standard for the Canadian government to meet on issues of equality. The appellant proposes that this distinction be overtaken by recognizing a positive duty on the government to take affirmative action when making a policy that affects the Canadian population at large. The charter was introduced into a racist world. The last residential schools had not yet been closed in 1982. And, and social outcomes for racialized people were worse than those of white people, as they continue to be today. The writers of the charter understood that they were introducing an equality provision into a deeply unequal Canada. What do we make of an equality provision introduced into an unequal world? So far, the answer has been that section 15 sub 2 is a carve out which merely allows the government to enact affirmative action policies, but does not compel it to do so. The appellant submits that this interpretation does not give effect to the promise of equality. Racial equality cannot be achieved without action. The respondent disagrees that there is a duty to consider race when making policy. The respondent that the denies that the federal government has any responsibility, nor even any jurisdiction, to collect critical data about its most vulnerable citizens during a global pandemic. Council, I, I just kind of have a, a question, um, you know, that's been on my mind for a bit since reading your factum. So it's been about 40 years since the introduction of um, the Charter of Rights, uh, I guess 39 years or so. 
in that 40 years has you know any level of court or let, let's stick to perhaps the supreme court has the supreme court interpreted section 15 in the manner that you're now asking us to interpret that provision no justice and if no court has interpreted it as a positive obligation and so you know given that we're being asked to do something that's you know new and perhaps some might consider radical or divisive why should we take that step today well justice and if critical race theory is in its essence to a degree somewhat radical it seeks change but our submission is that essentially the courts didn't get it right from the start there should have been a positive obligation the charter promised equality in a world where there was none and yet compelled no action to move towards equality only to maintain the status quo this goes against everything that critical race theory teaches us about fundamental structural institutions and how they must be changed in order to achieve equality this court was established above the supreme court the diversity high court and above the constitution our submission is that the purpose of this court is to make such changes thank you thank you as a secondary matter the appellant submits that the respondents arguments about jurisdiction should be more properly understood to engage the principles of administrative law rather than a division of powers since there is no legislation in issue as we understand it the respondent minister is not challenging the constitutionality of her own enabling statute but rather her authority under it in any case the respondent acknowledges at paragraph six page 16 excuse me of their factum that the covid 19 pandemic likely meets the criteria for federal legislative power under the emergency branch of the peace order and good government test our proposed interpretation of section 15 sub 2 makes action non-optional equality will not be achieved any other way as applied to the present case the proposed interpretation renders moot the action versus inaction debate as it pertains to charter application i move to the appellant's final equality measure found at page 15 of our factum we submit that the oaks test as it pertains to section 7 and 15 should be modified to include the insights of critical race theory as a guiding principle and as I'm short on time, I'll move to a brief example and then conclude. At paragraph four of the Supreme Court decision, the majority rhetorically asks for how many races and the seemingly infinite combination thereof must the minister collect such information? Justices, we don't know what the Supreme Court means by race. A critical race lens over the majority decision would man would demand that the majority justify its definitions and assumptions rather than making assertions that go unchallenged. Justices, in a few moments, my learned friends will address to you as to the minister's position. The respondent does not rely on critical race scholarship in their factum. For a critical race perspective to be met by a technical procedural argument by the government is nothing new. It is emblematic of the way that structural racism manifests in our legal system, that a black appellant comes to the courts with substantive claim and is sidestepped by a technicality. For the minister, the existing jurisprudence is acceptable. The status quo is fine. And there is no need to rely on the insights of CRT academics seeking radical structural change. But to racialized people in this country, people like Mr. Williams, the status quo is oppressive institutional racism, and we submit that to achieve equality, the status quo must change. And the only way that it will change is through this court. Why establish a, a diversity court unbound by the jurisprudence of our Supreme Court or our Constitution? We submit that the only answer is to change the law, to re-examine the establishment with a review to improving racial justice in this country. Today, we ask you to move three structural barriers from racialized appellant, the racialized appellant. First, excessive deference to a majoritarian parliament. Second, an artificially low standard for what constitutes equality policy. And third, the absence of critical race theory from our most important constitutional test. Justice is subject to your questions. That concludes my submissions.
Thank you, Ms. Lee. Sorry, uh, Ms. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, so um, I just ask everyone at this time: Does anyone need a, uh, a health break for two minutes, or are we okay? We're okay. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, respondents, anytime. Uh, sorry, before you begin, Justice Song, I don't think we at the beginning established whether the appellant was reserving any time for reply. Uh, well, I don't even know the rules on that. Uh, Madam Timer, do you know? Um, the 45 minutes did include the time for a reply. In any case, we weren't planning to reserve time for an apply, so. Oh, perfect. <laughs> All right, that makes it easy. Uh, thank you, Justice Neve. Uh, that's... Uh, it's important. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, respondents, whenever you're ready. Good morning, Justices. My name is Olivia Hu, and today my co-counsel Eunice Dapa and I are submitting to the Diversity High Court on behalf of the respondent, the Minister of Health. Just, uh, the respondent submits that the Minister's decision to not collect race-based data does not infringe Mr. Williams' Section 7 or Section 15 charter rights. Justices, this case is about protecting all societal interests during a pandemic where government actors, frontline workers, are required to balance a multitude of interests to protect those living in Canada effectively. This case is about not opening up the floodgates of imposing positive obligations on collecting race-based data. Therefore, the respondent seeks for this honorable court to dismiss the appellant's appeal and maintain the order of the Supreme Court of Canada. I would like to orient the court with a brief roadmap of the respondent's submissions today. First, the lack of collecting race-based data does not trigger Mr. Williams' Section 7 charter rights because no positive obligation exists and no positive obligation should be enforced. Second, the minister's decision to not collect race-based data does not infringe Mr. Williams' Section 15 equality rights because COVID-19 is affecting people across the globe regardless of race and socioeconomic status. Again, there is no obligation. Third, in the alternative, if race -based, collecting race-based data is necessary, it should be the provincial and municipal government's responsibilities to do so, especially during a pandemic as the levels of government are working really hard to deliver healthcare services effectively. I will be discussing the submission that Mr. Williams' Section 7 rights are not triggered. My co-counsel Eunice will submit the arguments on Section 15 and the theoretical arguments regarding collection responsibilities. Justices, the minister's choice to not collect race-based data does not trigger Mr. Williams' Section 7 rights. The respondent submits that Section 7 is not triggered for three reasons. Section 7 is not triggered because there is no positive obligation on the minister to collect this specific type of data. Second, there is no sufficient causal connection between collecting race-based data and Section 7. And third, Collecting race-based data is a policy argument that the courts should not interfere with. It is a, a decision for the legislature. Further, in the alternative, if Section 7 is triggered, life, liberty, and security are not infringed, and further, would be saved under Section 1 if any are triggered. Ms. Hu, your, your, your framework and your submissions, I understand all that, so I, I'm just going to present this to you. I mean. Have you, have you lost sight of the fact that we're actually, you are making your submissions during the actual pandemic itself? We are literally meeting virtually because all of us are at risk of infecting one another and whatnot, and we are all living under an emergency order under our different provinces. So I, I understand your submissions, but what do you make of the fact of the context in which the respondents are making this submission to deny this relief of, of the appellants? Well, while the pandemic might be a special circumstance, the, I'd like to bring up the, the foundational case of Gosselin that even the dissent stated that for this positive rights obligation to be determined, there must be a strong evidentiary foundation that failing to act substantially interferes with a charter right. 
And, and, and you don't think that emergency orders from the federal and provincial governments warrants warrants that special circumstance? No, because Why? specifically because the social determinants of health, specifically for this case, there are a multitude of factors for uh, social determinants of health that are known. Race is but one factor. And that one factor doesn't end at the pandemic for how many, as Justice Brown put it in the Supreme Court decision of this case, for how many different healthcare aspects are we to collect for, for how many different races and, and that um, in it, the social determinants of health, as I mentioned, they are known and race is but one factor. And so opening up that floodgates uh, is something that, that the respondent strongly believes should not happen in this court. It's all too convenient, isn't it, Ms. Hu? You know, all, all, of the, all of the evidence before us with critical race theory, it's always, it's always the same groups. It's always the indigenous, it's always black Canadians. Uh, it's, it's racialized groups. Do, do you think that there is something to be said about the intersectionality of race, that it is always the, the thread which binds inequality? That may be true, Justice, but these, it's about fixing factors in relation to each other. Like you said, the intersectionality, other major factors are important as well, food, work, food scarcity, education, those all play into uh, this, the disparities of health. And as I previously mentioned, this imposing this positive obligation, the minister has the authority to decide what to collect and how to collect it. The minister has the expertise um, and this should continue without imposing the positive obligation. Uh, the respondent understands that the charter should be developed slowly as novel circumstances arise. And while the pandemic falls under one of those positive, those novel circumstances, imposing this positive obligation is not this small incremental change to interpreting the charter. And this case here is similar to British Columbia and Christie, where the courts there did not impose a positive right to state funded counsel in judicial proceedings. And that there was, and it wasn't imposed because imposing that positive right would have significantly altered the delivery of legal services on top of creating a serious burden on taxpayers. And Justice Zong, you brought up the question for my friends about the potential for opening up the door uh, for collecting other types of data, such as finances, and whether collecting data stops at race. And the respondent's position specifically aligns with that concern, and we're specifically asking the court to consider that risk. Here, similar to Christie, that uh, imposing that positive right on the minister to collect race-based data, it creates this broad action, again, for the, the different various claims regarding data collection. And as I've mentioned, there's no way for knowing how many different healthcare aspects should the minister collect for. And it goes even beyond that. Should we collect finances, other types of data? There's, there's no way of knowing. This issue does not end when the pandemic ends. It has a potential to snowball into bigger effects. My friends submit that it's the role of the courts to interpret the charter in relation to legislation and to strike down legislative provisions and see whether these omissions are unconstitutional. Justices, the respondent respectfully differentiates this case from what the appellants have submitted because there is no legislative provision at hand. There's no doubt that the charter applies to government actors, but this case is about imposing positive obligations on the government where courts have not previously done. And just depending, you mentioned the difference between the H1N1 and this current pandemic. The respondent would like to highlight this difference. During a time where the number of COVID cases are rising and the healthcare systems are at risk of being overwhelmed, adding another obligation to the government system further strains it. And again, the floodgates that might ensue from enforcing this positive obligation, along with the lack of special circumstance, does not trigger Mr. Williams' Section 7 rights. Counsel, um, 
I appreciate you you bringing that up. Um, but just to go back, you know, a little bit to the point where you mentioned the risk of snowballing. So I understand, you know, there's a snowballing from your perspective, but I think there's probably a level of snowballing from the appellant's perspective, perspective rather, in that we we are already starting to see that there can be many long-term effects of COVID-19, both on an individual's health and on their socioeconomic status. So if there's a particular group that is pre, not predisposed, but is more vulnerable to getting COVID-19, the implications of perhaps one or two family members of a single unit having COVID-19 can last for generations, both in terms of perhaps health issues and then the resulting socioeconomic downturns that result, um, sorry, that accrue to family units that are suffering from COVID-19. And so we're not just dealing perhaps with, you know, the percentage of Black Canadians that exist now, but we're dealing with potentially generational issues coming from COVID-19 and, excuse me, the higher risk that these individuals face. So how do you balance those? There's two snowballing effects, in my view, at least. How do you balance those two? I've mentioned previously about the various social determinants of health and indicating that race is but one factor. When the government policies can implement different policies to target uh, education, to increase policies um, to ensure that that other families who are maybe live in low income areas have that access, um, that all those social determinants of health are already known. And I've mentioned before, the minister has that discretion to decide what, what types of data to collect. And in this case, this case is about imposing that positive obligation. And yes, while there may be a floodgates of the long-term effects of COVID-19 on families and in people who may live in lower income areas, that can also be uh, reconciled with different policies that specifically target other social determinants of health for the types of data that the government already collects. So in, in terms of the types of data that the government already collects, so, you know, we know a great deal about the effect of COVID-19 on elderly folks, and that's because that data is being collected, and that data is now being used to target um, testing in perhaps long-term care homes and for caregivers, and it is prioritizing who is getting the vaccine first. And so, are Black Canadians or other enumerated groups, because age is an enumerated group as well in, in the Charter, are Black Canadians and other marge, perhaps Indigenous Canadians, people living in remote communities, are they not entitled to that same protection that now our elderly citizens are receiving? They are entitled to the same protection, but Section 7 isn't triggered because there's no sufficient causal connection between collecting that race-based data and Section 7. It's uh, speculative and cannot be satisfied on a balance of probabilities. And the respondent in our factum at paragraph 14, uh, we apply the reasoning from Suresh in Canada that specifically states, and I'm quoting from my factum here, at le uh, Section 7 applies at least where Canada's participation is a necessary precondition for the deprivation and where the deprivation is an entirely foreseeable consequence of Canada's participation. And so this case, Suresh doesn't apply in this case at bar because the consequences of systemic racism means that this deprivation occurs without Canada's participation or choice to collect race-based data and the deprivation uh, already occurs. But the lack of participation is compelling too, isn't it? That there presently is no participation whatsoever from the minister for collection of data, yet all the factors of inequality exist. So how do you explain why this court should side with doing nothing? Well, because the respondent submits that collecting this data is, is this policy argument for the legislature that the courts should not interfere with. The respondent wants to highlight the distinction between political and, and legal issues. And this distinction is that important dichotomy. And, and without this 
the, and while the appellant submits that without this data, the respondent cannot provide care to um, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, but there's no indication that this data would effectively ameliorate the systemic racism that is currently present. And as I've mentioned, the minister has that expertise to collect and how to collect this data and the choice not to collect this data. This statement stands true, especially during the pandemic when government actors are taking steps uh, to effectively or try to effectively address this, this pandemic. Justices, as the Ontario Court of Appeal determined in Tanu Jaja, the court highlighted there to, to further on my insufficient legal component submission, that in that case, there was no sufficient legal component that triggered the Ontario Superior Court's uh, capacity to decide whether Canada was required to provide affordable, adequate, and accessible housing. There was no standard there for assessing whether housing policy was adequate. Similarly, there's no standard for assessing race-based data collection. The decision of to not to collect data engages the accountability of the legislatures, as a term we see in Tana Jaja. So the respondent submits that collecting this race-based data is beyond the limit of the court. And the court should consider the cost and collection of this data and protecting this race-based data while the government continuously responds to the pandemic reallocating economic sources. There's a balance that's needed between protecting the overall public and imposing new obligations that might likely strain the system. Justices, I'd like to turn to in the alternative, if uh, the respondent submits that if Section 7 is triggered, the minister's decision to not collect race-based data does not infringe the appellant's Section 7 rights. And this is argument E at page nine of the respondent's factum. First, life is not infringed because the disparities of COVID-19 are known without this race-based data. The mere lack of data does not directly or indirectly increase the appellant's risk of death. The respondent understands the consequences of systemic racism. The gov and the appellant argues that without the specific data, the government is blind to implementing policies that will assist disadvantaged groups. However, justices, as I've mentioned, race is only one factor in a multitude of social determinants. The social determinants of health are not unknown. Income, social status, employment and working conditions, physical conditions and gender are all specific social determinants of health. Race is one factor among many. Second, the appellant's claim does not meet the two components for a liberty infringement. First, there is no physical restraint directing at protecting the appellant. The appellant is still free to move around and make personal decisions under his autonomy. As I've mentioned, and I mention again, race is but one factor amongst the many social determinants of health. The appellant submits that Mr. Williams is unable to make, un to make informed choices for his health care. However, the respondent submits that even if the government were to collect this data, it would not automatically ameliorate any systemic racism. There's no evidence that any policy would, would help. Third, security of the person is not infringed because there's no evidence that the failure or the decision to not collect the specific type of data will prevent Mr. Williams from making his inherently private choices regarding his own autonomy. There is adequate access to other types of information that are included as part of the social determinants of health. There is no state action. There's no evidence the race-based data has a profound and serious effect. Finally, again, in the alternative, even if section seven or 15, section seven is infringed, it can be saved under section one of the charter. The respondent submits that the limit on a charter right is both reasonable and demonstrably justified as we've mentioned. Collecting race-based data, like I've mentioned before, would open up this floodgate of potential claims regarding specific types of data collection. This current Oaks test allows for a full consideration of infringements. And during unprecedented times such as this pandemic, it should be held consistent. 
And Justices, I understand that although Section 7 is difficult to justify under Section 1, the Supreme Court in Carter ruled in some situations the state may be able to show that the public good can be justified under Section 1. Specifically, the Ontario Court of Appeal in R.V. Michaud, uh, where the appellant was charged with having his speed limiter on his truck set higher to what was required by law. They, the court there believed that Michaud was precisely the type of situation because the purposes of speed limiter legislation for trucks was the improvement of highway uh, safety. But, but counsel, where, where is the public good here in, in not collecting data that might benefit um, you know, a large percentage of Canadians? The public good here um, is the allocation of resources to ensure that all Canadians are being adequately responded to. And so we are looking, yes, Justice. I think that's exactly what your friends are trying to say is that, you know, there's a particular group here that is vulnerable to COVID-19 and they're not being adequately responded to because the data that can help prevent the transmission and could perhaps improve the treatment and potential um, vaccination of this group is not being collected. So, you know, I think that's exactly what they're trying to say is their interests aren't being protected as opposed to white Canadians. Justice, is the respondents, while well, the respondents believe that this is about in po this is about the making sure that resources are allocated and especially in a time at the pandemic as unprecedented as the pandemic the government is working to put resources in various different areas and uh, race again like i've mentioned is but one out of many social determinants of health and focusing on edu uh, work uh, and focusing the the, in the economic resources on maybe providing a place, like you've mentioned, for, for families maybe to isolate, that uh, the, the respondent believes that that is a better way to allocate those resources than to simply put a tick on a, a sheet and then create those policies that might not even come into effect in time to adequately address this issue. Thank you. Justices, the appellants submit that the, they suggest the Oaks test to include critical race theory to guide it. While the respondent agrees, but even if there was an infringement here, the Oaks law as it currently stands is about laws. There is no laws. Justices, to conclude, the respondents submit that the minister's choice to not collect race-based data does not engage Section 7 of the Charter. There is no positive obligation in the courts, nor should the courts enforce this positive obligation on the minister to collect this data. That concludes the respondent's submissions on Section 7. I'll now turn over to my co-counsel Eunice, who will discuss Section 15 and the responsibilities in the alternative for collection of data. Thank you, Justices. Thank you, Ms. Hu. Um, and uh, Council, uh, how, how do I pronounce your last name? Dapa. Dapa, thank you. Uh, proceed, Ms. Dapa. Good morning, Justices. My name is Eunice Dapa, and I will be presenting the respondent's submission on Section 15 of the Charter and the Critical Race Theory Argument. My submissions begin at paragraph 25 of the respondent's factum. <clears throat> The appellants have submitted that the minister's failure to collect race-based data infringes upon Mr. Williams' Section 7 and 15 rights. My friends have centered the bulk of their argument on racial injustice and inequality in Canada. Respectfully, this case is not about that. This case is rather about whether or not the minister has a positive obligation to collect race-based data for the COVID-19 pandemic. Such an obligation would be imposed if the failure to collect data infringed on either Section 7 or 15 of the Charter. Again, this case is centered on whether there is a positive obligation on the federal government to collect race-based data. 
not on whether the government has responded to societal racial inequities adequately. I will outline the respondents' arguments by highlighting that the lack of race-based data collection does not infringe upon the appellant section 15 charter rights. My analysis proceeds in three parts. First, I outline the legal test for section 15 to emphasize that there is indeed no mandate or law requiring the data collection. I then proceed uh, by explaining that section 15 does not impose positive obligations on the minister and therefore charter obligations cannot be instituted where the right does not exist. I then explain lastly that the section 15 argument um, highlighting that the collection of race-based data or the lack thereof is not synonymous with the provision of health care. Section 15 of the Charter outlines equality protections. More specifically, the Charter provides equality and the protection of um, and protection and benefit of law without discrimination based on race, color, sex, etc. While the appellants argue that Section 15 is engaged because failing to collect race-based data equates to discrimination, in fact, race-based data collection is not mandated under the law. The lack of collection does not meet the equality test set out by the court in law in Canada as a requirement for a successful Section 15 claim. The test states that the claimant must establish differential treatment under the law on the basis of an enumerated or analogous ground, which constitutes discrimination. In this case, the appellants cannot ground a current Section 15 claim in a non-existing existent benefit because there is no duty or obligation to collect race-based data. Ms. Dappa, I, okay, so your, uh, your friend, Ms. Hu, uh, did a very broad overarching argument. So, so you're, you're the last in the, you're the last in the firing range, should I say. So, so I'm going to be asking you questions on this and, I, and I'm just going to tell you which way I'm leaning. So the, the entire argument about that this court doesn't have a positive obligation or the minister doesn't, I, I'm, I don't accept that. Okay. So, so let's assume that I accept that to, to be true, that, that, that I believe that this court might have a positive obligation to do so. Why? If you look at Carter versus Canada and you look at the ruling with the Supreme Court, they clearly overturned and, and found that the criminal provisions uh, violated Section 7. Okay, so, uh, so that, that's my bent on that, I'm just telling you. So, with respect to what the appellants are asking, what is so harmful about what they're asking? They're just asking for a little ticky box to be put on some forms when uh, there's a census or when there's an individual being sought for treatment. What, 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 what's the harm? Um, there is no harm. I agree with you. There's no harm in checking off a box, but I think it extends. Um, and my analysis proceeds when we get into the critical race theory argument. I think it's a matter of addressing the matter where it should be addressed. In this case, uh, the respondent believes that it should be addressed in terms of what the province should do. Um, I can quickly just answer the question. Um, I'll move to my critical race theory argument just to give you um, an overview. But our position is that it should be a provincial um, position to perhaps collect race-based data because they are better able to understand the people within their borders. As it currently stands, I believe there are about 3.7% um, of the population is black in Canada. But those that 3%, 3.7%, uh, uh, about, um, not an exact estimate, but that percentage is clustered in different areas. So I think the government should take, or we, the, there should be a ground up approach in that it's not the mandate of a federal government to do a blanket approach, which um, allocates resources in, in ways that don't deal with the problem at hand. Um, we do accept that, you know, there are social determinants of health, there are systematic um, failures in terms of uh, social term, so, socio determinants of health where there's food inequities, uh, wage inequities, education inequities, a lot of things that result in health disparities. Um, as my co-counsel stated, race is one factor of many, but we believe it can be dealt with from a bottom-up approach where the provincial government 
allocates resources where they are necessary, where they can make the most impact, not necessarily as easy as um, ticking off a checkbox because it goes to one thing about ticking off a checkbox and no change is made. But here we're saying let's allocate the resources if it's in terms of, you know, there's a disparity in Black people being more affected, let's put those vaccinations in those areas. Just like Justice Hanif had mentioned, we're aware that um, there are a lot of problems with respect to uh, older populations. And because of that awareness, we're now allocating vaccinations to those populations. But we know that because each province and each municipality is able to say, hey, this is a problem that we're facing. And then we're able to recognize that as an overarching issue. So the, the allocation of resources, the, the um, collection of race-based data in the alternative should be done on a provincial level. It should be done on a municipal level and it should be done outside of the court. It should be done with policy changes and changes that are able to actually touch the lives of the, the populations impacted. But, but Ms. Ms. Dapp, I, I really appreciate your answer. That was, that was a very um, uh, cohesive, eloquent answer, but, but I think it misses the point. I, I think, you know, your suggestion of, of sending this back to the municipalities and the provinces, it, that's sending this entire question back to the fire where this whole question came from. So, so I don't accept this separation of powers argument necessarily as being a reason in and of itself to deny the relief because all the roads converge on this one question before the Diversity Court of Canada, which is, should this court examine, accept the critical race theory arguments in order to compel the provinces to, to modify their behaviors for a overarching federal issue? So, so, so the point, my, my point is this, I understand what you're saying, but your remedy does nothing to address any of the appellant's concerns. Um, thank you, Justice. Respectfully, I believe that the remedy is the way to address their concern. Um, perhaps it hasn't been looked at in light of what I'm saying, but I do know that in terms of legislation, like you mentioned, the court in Aton said that um, there was no governing legislation that could provide a benefit. So the exclusion in that case was not discriminatory. And the, um, the, the question there was providing funding for all medically required treatment. I think that speaks towards the federal government's role in this position where there is no positive obligation because there's no legislation, there's no mandate. That's why uh, the federal government feels that it's better to go back to a grassroots perspective where um, legislation can be enacted by the voice of the people. So it can be done from a grassroots perspective where municipalities can engage with their communities and see what the issue is, and then actually take steps towards ameliorating the issues that are in hand. Rather okay, than Ms. Tapa, so, so let's, let's assume that this court denies the relief from the appellants, okay? Um, how long do you think is acceptable for the public to wait for legislation to even come near this issue of, of race-based data collection? One year, two years, five years, maybe 10 years? The next pandemic, what do you think? Um, my perspective on that is, it's not necessarily about um, race-based data collection. I say that because the data can be collected, sure, assuming the data is collected. It's not about the collection of data per se, it's about the actions that move towards making change. Um, the federal government can definitely collect race-based data. I say that, uh, to give you an example, um, there is collection of uh, disparity of police stops in Toronto. Um, this change, this, this collection of data did not move towards really making a difference between the number of incarceration levels in um, in the in the jails. So it's not necessarily about collecting data for the sake of collecting data, but I believe that it should be collecting data for the sake of actually implementing change. Or and and more specifically to that, um, I believe that it should be at a level where the people who are uh, collecting that data, if such data is collected, are able to enact change within their um, 
specific area of influence. And that's why uh, the federal government keeps tossing it back in a sense to provincial and municipalities because it's easy for a federal legislation to come into play that says, you know, everybody collects data or everyone should collect race-based data. That would move towards areas that are not impacted by, um, let's say, race-based uh, 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 statistics that would now have this imposition to collect data that could put more um, burdens on the um, the hospital administration staff that could put more burdens on um, the 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 issues. So, sorry, rather than um, using a financial allocation towards perhaps treatment, there would be more burden in collecting data that does nothing for the people at hand. So, I think the federal argument here is that there should be no imposition of a positive obligation on the government to collect data, but rather our critical race theory speaks to the fact that the data, if collected, should be done so where the impact would be greatest. Ms. Dappa, I mean, I'm just going to bring you back to the basic words of, of the charter and the statute. So, so section, uh, section 15 sub 1, it says, Uh, Justice Song, I think um, you're frozen at least on my screen and, and we missed your question. Justice Tanu, should I continue with my submission? Uh, yes. Every foreign under the law. And sorry, so Justice, how can this. Justice Song, you were no? frozen for a bit. So if you could repeat, sorry. Sorry, guys. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, my apologies. Okay, uh, Ms. Dappa, I'm just going to bring you back to the actual statute itself. It says every individual is equal before and under the law, and so forth. And my question is, how can this court understand who every individual is if we don't know who they are? Um, to speak to your question, um, I think that the the court also explained in Widler with respect to section 15 that a distinction is created if the claimant is treated differently than others or if they assert that they're getting a benefit that others are not granted by reason of one of the characteristics of the enumerated or analogous grounds. And in this case, our position is that um, everybody is being treated for the vaccine, uh, sorry, for COVID-19. It's not a matter of um, Mr. Williams or any other Black Canadian, any racialized or BIPOC individual going to receive or going to the hospital for treatment and being turned away on the basis of race or um, being turned away on the basis of sex or gender. It's not a matter of that. We believe that everybody is being treated for the COVID-19 pandemic. Everyone is um, getting whatever uh, uh, vaccinations are currently in place. And this again is an evolving issue. It's not, you know, um, like you both mentioned, H1N1, which had a statistically smaller impact. This is being um, felt across boards, young and old, poor, rich. It's in, in a sense non-discriminatory in how people are being impacted by the pandemic. So we believe that there should be an allocation um, to everyone in the sense that the allocation, the allocation of resources should belong to collecting um, uh, vaccination, collecting things that will help the population on a whole um, because its impact is on a broad scale. Does that answer your question? I, I'm sorry, my internet cut out there for a second. Um, uh, can you just summarize the last argument in a couple of seconds? I'm sorry. I, it, I was just saying um, it, it happens on a broad scale. Everyone is being uh, uh, impacted by the pandemic and um, I'm not sure. So sorry, I did actually hear that before I cut out. Um, so here's my okay, so here's my response to uh, Ms. Dappa. So so I, I fully understand your argument in that uh, and I actually pose this to the appellants, which is, you know, how is a black man or a white man treated differently when they're actually getting treated? And I wasn't necessarily convinced that they answered that question. So I'll pose that same question to you, which is this. You know, assuming that the treatment is the same after the fact, after COVID is diagnosed, well, 
why is this the standard that we're uh, accepting? Shouldn't medical care be uh, anticipatory? Shouldn't it be preventative as opposed to reactionary? Um, that's a great question, uh, Justice. And I think the nature of medical care um, as it pertains specifically to COVID-19 is reactionary. I say that because this has never happened before. There are no models to follow. There is no guideline. Even vaccination rollout is happening on an unprecedented scale. Um, you know, we're reacting to what has come up. Even now, there are instances of, I believe, you know, different strains of the virus that we are reacting to. Um, it's not something that could have been predicted to happen. So I believe that, as your question was posed, you know, it's, it's happening to everybody. Um, medical advances are being made to react to it. Um, in terms of how we can be proactive, it's about addressing the other aspects of um, social determ socio determinants of health. It's about addressing the fact that um, BIPOC communities are in mar um, or marginalized communities live in areas where there's um, less access to education, less access to food. Um, there's more instability in terms of workplace security. There's more instability um, in terms of you know policing. So it's a matter of addressing the factors that uh, cater to health. I think if we address um, just specifically uh, the fact that you know me medical advances should be made in order to prevent health, I think we're missing a key element. And I think the crux of this argument relies on the fact that a there's no positive obligation to impose this obligation to collect race-based data specifically to the minister, and b the issue should turn back to the provincial and municipal governments to ensure that communities that are marginalized, that results that have this health effect in as a result, the issues that lead to that should be addressed because it's easy to say that, you know, um, the black community should get the vaccinations first, but the actual issue that should be addressed is the fact that they have um, the access to, to food there's instability there, there's inequity, you can't get fresh foods, you can't get, you know, constant uh, workplace um, security. So these things end up or result to uh, poor health care. So that's what should be addressed first. It, it, it seems to me, Ms. Dapa, that, that, you know, this race question is, is sort of being danced around in the sense that the minister is already collecting information on age, on on, uh, on uh, you know, vocation, they're asking, they already have information on uh, sex, gender, all these other issues. But yet, race, we just, you know, we, we, we leave it to be the elephant in the room. So, you know, I, I mentioned this question and I asked uh, Ms. Hu, your friend, uh, so why shouldn't this court, why shouldn't this court directly address this question in a forward thinking way? accepting the the obvious elephant in the room with respect to race and simply just give direction to the, the remainder of the country with respect to how how this country what direction it should go uh justice in answer to the question i believe that it's not the solution that should prevail um, respectfully. I believe that this court should rather give direction to, again, the bodies that are able to better cater to the needs of um, the, the, to the needs of the population. For example, if this court were to make a mandate that, hey, let's say the federal government needs to collect race-based data, that data could very well be collected and shoved in the back of the closet, um, not implemented and not changing structures that need to be changed fundamentally. Um, it needs to go back to uh, populations that can make the, the greatest impact. Um, why do we address uh, uh, old age homes and retirement homes first? Because that's where the change needs to happen first to prevent them from um, passing away essentially. So in the same vein, the change needs to happen in municipalities, it needs to happen in provinces because they are better equipped to deal with 
the issues that are within their borders rather than a federal band-aid, so to speak, to just legislate and mandate without actual action or grassroots organizations to um, deal with the problem at hand. So, so Ms. Dappa, you, you so I, I just want to ask you this. So, so you, on behalf of the respondents, you accept the proposition that we live in a colorblind society, correct? No. You don't, because it sounds like, to me, that's what you're suggesting. We should know everything else about everyone, which is race, gender, sex, you know, uh, uh, geography, address, place of living, maybe even country of origin. But let's just leave out the race issue. Um, Justice, I'm running low on time, so I'm just going to uh, ask for more time to answer your yes, question. Yes, so, um, so uh, Justice Hanif, uh, do you agree to grant her the ability to answer my question and also conclude? Yes, I was going to say perhaps we could grant Ms. Dapp an additional minute on top of her allocation because of the technical issues. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, t t yeah, that's fine. Okay, I agree. Um, dealing with your question of colorblind, I think it would uh, be best um, because, so we agree, by the way, that race is an issue. We. Our proposition though is that race is not the um, impending issue that fixes the, the, the crux of the problem. We believe that race is one of the many factors, but the factors that lead to marginalization in healthcare should be addressed. Not necessarily that there's a colorblind, uh, no, we don't believe that um, there is colorblindness, but we would say rather that it's not possible for, um, if you look at the provincial government's jurisdiction over health, it's it might lead to issues that cause a um, privacy concerns, data leaks as it pertains to um, collecting health care. If we look at race specifically, um, it might lead to more marginalizations, undue hardships if um, protections aren't provided for race specifically. We've seen this with, um, for example, our friends in the United States where the virus was called the Chinese virus and all of a sudden there were issues with individuals um, suffering more undue hardships than necessary. So I think the, the base of the problem is to not impose this positive obligation on the minister, but rather deal with issues that result in undue hardships for um, minorities for racialized communities, and that should, in the respondent's um, opinion, result in better healthcare outcomes. And just to conclude, um, as I've said earlier, you know, the rest of I, I rely on my factum for the rest of the submissions, but there is no infringement upon Section 7 and Section 15 rights. And um, the respondent's critical race argument, I think, should be really heavily relied on where the task should fall to the provincial governments without federal interference to um, make, make sure that the values of federalism are upheld. And it's for this, these reasons that your honor should affirm the decision by the Supreme Court of Canada and find in favor of the respondent. Justices, these are our submissions. 